Welcome back to another episode on the build of my 1983 Toyota Starlet. If you've been following along, you've been watching me from a couple of years back take this car from a real beaten up shell, fixed all the rust, panel beaded it, painted it, got it back to a going car, and then I decided that I'd done all this work, had a big gearbox, big diff, I'd done everything, and it had a motor that was really lacking it down. So I decided that I wanted to fabricate a turbocharger package for the 4AG that's in it. And so if you watch my previous two videos, one's been fabricating a stainless steel exhaust manifold and one's been fabricating an aluminium inlet manifold. Now, as it stands, I've actually finished the entire, all the fabrication for the setup. And I've just got a couple more videos that I want to put out. This video is going to be getting an intercooler in there, mounting the intercooler up, making some intercooler piping. And then the next video I want to do is the entire stainless steel exhaust, uh, exhaust that I built for the car, which turned out awesome. So like I said, this video is going to be intercooler piping. It was pretty straightforward on this car. Intercooler went on nice and easy. It's nice big space for it. Intercooler pipes are short, so they're easy to plumb. Uh, hopefully you can follow along. This entire fabrication um, work that I've been doing on this setup, I kind of just pushed record on the camera and just filmed it, and then I'm, I'm re-looking at everything and editing a video up afterwards. So hopefully you can follow along, see what I've done. Um, if you like what you see, go back and watch some of the other videos. This one's quite short, but some of the previous ones are quite long, pretty in-depth of just the amount of work that goes into custom fabricating parts for a car like this. So um, sit back, take a watch, hope you enjoy what you see, and uh, if you like it, keep an eye out for the next video, which like I said is going to be full stainless steel exhaust fabrication for the car, which turned out really cool. There's a lot of welding went into it, so that should make a good little video. But for now, sit back and watch uh, how I went about mounting an intercooler and get some intercooler piping done. Dostoevsky said that in Notes from the Underground, a great, great book. And, you know, he said, I love this. It was his, uh, an early criti crit criticism of the notion of a political utopia. He said, look, if you gave people everything they wanted, they had nothing to eat but cake, and nothing to do but sit in warm pools and busy themselves with the continuation of the species, that was his, his lines, that the first thing they would do, well, maybe after the first week, was like go kind of half insane and smash everything up just so that something that they didn't expect would happen so that they'd have something interesting to do. And it's, it's so right because, you know, the, the utopian notion that if you just had all the material stuff you wanted that you'd, you'd be, well, what would you be? What, what would you do? Would, would you just sit on the couch and, and watch TV? I mean, you'd, you'd, you'd be... I don't know what, you'd be cutting yourself just for entertainment in no time flat, you know, and that's the sort of thing that people do. And so we're not adapted for security and utopia. We're adapted for a certain amount of security because, you know, we are vulnerable, but mostly we want to have one foot out where we don't know what the hell is going on because that's where you're alert and alive and tense and with it. And, and, you know, I think, I believe this, and I believe it actually has something to do with the hemispheric structure of, of the physiology of your brain, is because the right hemisphere looks roughly adapted to what you don't know, and the left hemisphere, and this is a very, this is an oversimplification, but a useful one, is adapted to the world that you do know, and the right place for you to be is halfway between them. Because that, and you can tell that, that's what's so cool. And, and this tells you that this is actually reality that's manifesting itself to you. You know that sense of active engagement you have in the world when things are working well for you, you know, where you're, where you should be at the right time. You're alert and on top of things and engaged and you don't have much of a sense of time. And the sense of the tragedy of life sort of recedes and that's when you're, that's when you've got one foot when it's, where it's secure and one foot out in the unknown. And your brain signals to you that you're in the right place by making what you're doing meaningful. And that sense of meaning is actually a neurophysiological signal that you've got the forces of the cosmos properly balanced in your being at that moment. And that's why it feels so good. And now, well, what else could it possibly be? I mean, you know, our, our, our brain is capable of looking beyond our vision that's what it's for. 
And that sense of engagement, there's no reason to assume that that's anything but a real signal. And you can reduce it. You could say, well, the problem with being where you know only is that you don't know everything. And that's going to be a problem in the future. And the problem with being where you know nothing is <laughs> that's just too much, man. Like, you know, you go into panic mode and because anything can happen there and you can't handle it. So you've got to mediate between those two things. You want to be secure enough so that your physiology isn't revving out of control. And you want to be out there in the unknown enough so that you keep updating yourself constantly, constantly, constantly. And that's, that's the place where information flow is maximized. And you know that because that's where you are when you're having a really interesting conversation with someone or you're gripped by a book or you're really into a movie or maybe something that you do as a you know apart from your work or maybe even in your work you're into it and that's because you are in the right place at the right time and your whole nervous system is signaling that to you and I would say that's the sort of place that you should be all the time if, of course you can't be because no one's perfect but it's that's that's the recreation of paradise on earth it's something like it because you are in the right place at the right time when that is happening and so we're mobile creatures, right? We need to know where we're going because all we're ever concerned about, roughly speaking, is where we're going. That's what we need to know. Where are we going? What are we doing and why? It turns out that the way that we're constructed neurophysiologically is that we don't experience any positive emotion unless we have an aim and we can see ourselves progressing towards that aim. It isn't precisely attaining the aim that makes us happy. As you all know, if you've ever attained anything, because as soon as you attain it, then the whole little game ends. Then you have to come up with another game, right? So it's, it's Sisyphus, and that, that's okay. But, but it does show that the attainment can't be the thing that drives you because it collapses the game. That's what happens when you graduate from university. It's like you're king of the mountain for one day, and then you're like surf at, 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 at Starbucks for the next five years, you know? So, yeah. So what happens is that, that human beings are weird creatures because we're much more activated by having an aim and moving towards it than we are by attainment. And what that means is you have to have an aim and that means you have to have an interpretation. And it also means that the nobler the aim, that's one way of thinking about it, the better your life. And that's a really interesting thing to know because you know, you've heard ever since you were tiny that you should act like a good person and you shouldn't lie, for example. And you might think, well, wh why the hell should I act like a good person and why not lie? I mean, even a three-year-old can ask that question because smart, smart kids learn to lie earlier, by the way. And they, they think, well, why not twist the fabric of reality so that it serves your specific short-term needs? I mean, that's a great question. Why not do that? Why act morally? If you can get away with something and it, it brings you closer to something you want, well, why not do it? They, these are good questions. It's not self-evident. Well, it seems to me tied in with what I just mentioned. It's like you destabilize yourself and things become chaotic. That's not good. And if you don't have a noble aim, then you have nothing but, but shallow, trivial pleasures. And they don't sustain you. And that's not good because, because life is so difficult, so much, it's so much suffering, it's so complex. It ends and everyone dies and it's painful. It's like without a noble aim, how can you withstand any of that? You can't, you become desperate. And once you become desperate, things go, things go from bad to worse very rapidly when you become desperate. And so there's the idea of the noble aim. And it's, it's not something, it's, it's something that's necessary. It's the bread that people cannot live without, right? That's not physical bread, it's the noble aim. And what is that? Well, it's to pay attention, it's to speak properly, it's to confront chaos, it's to make a better world. It's something like that. And that's enough of a noble aim so that you can stand up without, you know, cringing at the very thought of your own existence so that you can do something that's worthwhile to justify your wretched position on the planet. And whatever it is that is you has this capacity to experience reality and to transform it, which is a very strange thing, you know. You can conceptualize a future in your imagination and then you can work and make that manifest you participate in the process of creation. That's an amazing idea because it gives consciousness a constitutive role in the cosmos.
as you saw, that intercooler and piping was all pretty simple really, in the scheme of fabricating anyway. Uh, it all went together real nice, nice and simple. I think it's worth pointing out that with jobs like this on your car, if you're doing this sort of stuff, stuff yourself, um, I think it's just really worth spending the time and just, just think about the use of the car, think about what's going to happen to parts. Um, I see plenty of cars where guys just sort of slap into coolers and stuff in there and things rub and they're loose and it's just it's just poor workmanship. So if you're going to do this sort of stuff, spend a little bit of time. It doesn't need to look a million bucks. You don't need to be a fabrication god or anything to do it, but just, um, you know, make sure, use all the bolt holes, bolt things down properly, tighten things up, make sure stuff doesn't rub. It's all pretty simple. Um, and I think, you know, you do need a bit of gear to do some of this stuff, but um, a lot of it's not the hardest either. Um, so yeah, if you have a go at this stuff, just just give it a good shot and just think about the end product that you want. Now, um, like I said, the next video is going to be the full exhaust fabrication, so it should be a good video to watch as a bit of work went into it and it's a few different things I did, so it's pretty cool. Now, uh, I'm going to assume you're not stupid and you know what this is behind me. If, if you've watched some videos, you've seen this before. Uh, so this is the car that I'm going to be making some videos on in the near future. So I did sort of think I wasn't going to film any of it, but as usual for me, it escalated a touch. So there'll be a bit to film, a bit to show you, and uh, should be a cool little project. So yeah, thanks for watching.